Welcome to another edition of the Diversified Semantic Layer Podcast. This is Eric Vallow, and I'm joined back in my my element recording at night with uh, my pals, Jamie Oswald and Greg Myers. Hey, guys. How are you? Uh, back for... Uh, we, we have the distinguished honor of, of having Mr. John Reed join us once again. What up? What up, yo? What's going on? Ah. Uh, Glad to see you, man. And and finally, a new face to this show, uh, a local pal here that uh, even not a St. Louis in here, I only ever see him in St. Louis, <laughs> Mr. Wes Carver. He's uh, a friend from SenseCorp here in St. Louis. Thanks. Glad to be here, Eric. Uh, yeah, so um, we, we put out the call for this show to to rehash the, the conversation on building BI teams. I think it's it's been like two years ago we did a panel on this, isn't it, Jamie? Am I crazy? Is that the one it's, Greg fell asleep in? It could be. It, it was uh, it well, was a pretty out. long time ago. Passed out, probably more. <laughs> fell asleep. Fell asleep. Right, right. Um, and and so the catalyst of the conversation is just the ever changing definition of what constitutes a BI team. I think so. Uh, you know, the term analytics gets thrown around and. ETL sometimes gets lumped in there, and and now we have the new Hana teams. You know, we we have to learn to play well with BW teams. So let's let's dive in. Let's let's challenge the paradigm. That's a paradigm for you culturally, some people. So um, what? Let's talk a little bit about maybe the old definition of a team. Um, when you guys think about a BI team from Yay! Ten years ago, um, who were the major players? What what made it work? So you had your infrastructure guys. You had the people that actually ran the BI platform and could tune SQL queries. You had the developers who would actually build the the reports, and then you had your business analysts who were close to the business side, and they're the ones that were close to the customers and helped actually define the requirements for what was actually going to be built. Right? And that was kind of the, the core of a BI team in those yonder days. See, and I think an interesting question is, where does a BI team live? Does it live within IT? Does it live in a business? Does it live by itself? Uh, is it split somewhere between there? You know, that, that's where, where do you think it, it's been most successful in the past? Well, I think it just depends a lot on the organization. I think if your organization has a reputation for having a successful IT department, then your BI team can do very well in that. If your IT team has very low credibility in your organization, then you'll want your BI team, much like everything else, to be outside of that organization. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, where are you going to put the impetus for doing, and now now I'm jumping forward to today, and maybe not so much historically, but who, who's got the impetus? Who's in charge of defining, discovering what the new interesting analytics are that's going to improve your business? I mean, and is that something that, you know, the IT organization is even capable of doing? Well, I, I think historically, and from my experience, that, that the most successful BI teams have been the ones that are driven from the business, that the IT part is really transparent. So yeah, that, that kind of answers the, the today question too, right? I think that it, when getting that information to the business is ubiquitous, that that's when it's most successful. When you have all this other IT overhead and all the red tape that we IT people love to put in place to make it hard to get that stuff, that's when it, it starts being uh, more arduous and, and hard. it makes it harder to get the, to the end goal, right? Which is really, you know, in in a nutshell, it's turning data into information, right? We, we as IT, we have data. We love our databases, our data warehouses, but it doesn't mean a hill of beans unless it's information that the business people can make decisions off of. So whatever we can do to make that transparent, I think, is when it becomes most successful. Uh, yeah, is my microphone even on? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Oh, hey, John. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see myself the way I want to see myself, but maybe that's <laughs> Google Plus making an editorial decision for me. Mm-hmm. As long well, as my I mean, audio is working, I don't give a shit about everything else. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that, what's been said so far. And when you looked at the sort of classic BI project 
in many ways it resembled a classic ERP project. It was huge, unwieldy, IT-centric, and it failed to deliver results, and we read headlines all the times, and Gartner and other analyst firms made money presenting results that BI didn't work. And now we have a whole opportunity, I think, with a different set of tools and priorities around smaller projects that are much more business-centric. They might even have cloud and mobile delivery built in to give users more of that on-the-go experience they're looking for. And, of course, the problem is that it's pushing everyone outside the comfort zone to figure out how to deliver these projects. So I guess that's an opportunity for smart people and a roadblock for people who liked it the way it was. I'm a dinosaur. I went yeah. backwards for you guys. My it's only for you. Uh, it looks like they have a banner now. That's pretty cool. Hey, dinosaurs yeah. had a, dinosaurs had a good run, man. <laughs> they did. Well, I mean, every generation has a dinosaur. So, so just cracking that back just a little bit, you know, um, I I'm not sure we answered that that fundamental question: Who actually owns BI in an organization? Is it is it IT? Or is it the CFO and his lines of business? Where does that reside before you even start to define a team? Who pays for it? Yeah, yeah, and, and again, I think it depends on the on the company, on the organization. I mean, I've seen proficient IT organizations that have BI within IT, and it works great. Uh, I've I've seen it. I guess I've I've never really seen it completely within the business. I mean, I've seen it as its own standalone institution that's working on behalf of the business. You know, sometimes you, you get the split teams where there's the doers within IT and then the product owners uh, on the business side and finance, accounting, operations, whatever it may be. Um, I, I mean, I'm going to give the generic consulting answer here in the sense it depends, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd want to look at the relationship a company has to IT, right? Because when you look at it, there there's companies that have really outsourced the bulk of those operations, and they have a very different stance. You kind of have this IT as cost center approach, which is much more about being very conservative, looking more at security and compliance and getting rid of everything else. Um, and I think there's a very limited role for BI in that context. But when you start looking at IT as, I don't know how you would call it, like a value center, like IT basically making your company better and smarter, then I think BI is right in the middle of that conversation. So I think it really depends on a company's philosophy. How many companies get to talk about their IT department like that? You know, there's a few. You hear, um, like Greg Schwartz, the CIO at USAA, he, he likes to talk about the, the IT organization at USAA being a profit center, profit generator by creating innovation. Um, and they do a pretty incredible job. Uh, but to your point, it's, it's few and far between. I mean, you know, I think it's sort of, sort of the holy grail for a CIO as to how do I create my organization to be a value center or an innovation center that's, that's creating value for the business. You know, I've always I've always worked in organizations that had chargeback models and and cost centers and all that. But even more recently, um, I worked with a customer as a, an apparel manufacturer that actually had a, a bill rate that was attributed to every person going back to that project for the customer, and and the customers knew it. And my thought was, wow, that's that's a commoditization of IT right there within your own organization. It, at, at what point then does this customer say, oh, you're X dollars now, or I, I think I'm going to go see what I can find on the open market and bring <laughs> it on my own? Well, the interesting thing is that the charge pack model actually plays pretty well into some of the trends that are emerging because one of the ways that IT can retain value is go to the business users and saying, look, you're procuring a lot of services via smaller vendors in the cloud, let me wrap these services with identity and security and, and essentially give them back to you. And a lot of times you would then charge the business for that. So some, some of that can actually work. I think it depends on what you're selling back to the business. If you're selling the business just a bunch of sort of red tape uh, and testing periods, then that's not going to work. But, you know, it's interesting because businesses, you know, they it's always like, oh, let's spare the business user from any involvement in testing or but as far as I'm concerned, like, if the business doesn't want to get someone involved, then they get what they deserve. So 
I don't know if that ties back into the team's discussion or not, but... Hey, I, what? Well, uh, I said it's loosely related still, right? Well, I mean, because I, it, it comes down to who's who's paying for it and, and how we're going to build it. We'll get there. So I, I think that that brings up uh, a couple of really interesting points, um, not the least of which is is how do we effectively do that chargeback without being a less uh, attractive offering than you can find on the open market, right? I mean, it seems very obvious to me that, uh, you know, the second... And I've personally never worked anywhere where they did charge back. So I think that it's... Um, it's kind of a tough hustle, you know. I mean, a lot of what we like to do, especially in BI, is push out the innovation to the business. Um, but how do we do that if uh, if we're trying to charge them for it and they're not necessarily interested in buying yeah. it yet? Yeah. I got another. Yeah, and especially if you're trying to build some more foundational pieces, which which aren't going to provide the sexy business value initially. You know, it's going to be, you really have to do a great sales job to convince them to invest in that model in that way. Well, and especially if it's the second or third time you've tried to do it, right? Because I think yeah. a lot of companies are in the, the situation where they built a data warehouse with with somebody, either internal or external, you know, and that kind of, you know, 12% of that is used going forward. But then they've, you know, built their spread marks beside that, Um and, and now you're trying to pitch them, well, it's really time to do it right. Um, I think that's kind of a, a really tough hustle. Yeah, and, and Eric, rein me in if we're moving off this too quickly, but, I mean, I think somebody else managed, uh, mentioned earlier the a more of a highly iterative, or I hate to say it, but agile approach to developing quicker, more iterative wins uh, from a BI perspective. And there are more tools in place today to do that than there were five years ago. Mm -hmm. So, maybe trying to shepherd us back towards <laughs> uh, back towards the middle here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the dynamics of that changing team. Um, you know, in in recent years, there was those conversations about where do you know basis teams and business objects infrastructure teams live together, and and how do you you know, your Bex developers coexist with your business objects developers, but you know what are we seeing in terms of market trend of those same types of people running out for their HANA certification and um, trying to wrap their hands around being some kind of a database person as opposed to just being an agnostic BI person? Is, is that happening? Well, I, I still think there's that distinct disconnect between your traditional basis people and your traditional business objects administration people. So I know a lot of these companies that are traditional SAP customers that run ERP, CRM, whatever, the business suite stuff that are, are being forced into business objects will chuck the business objects work at their basis folks and the basis folks go, eh, what is this, right? So it's it's really still a very different thing. They're, they're very different and I think that those two roles are still very distinct, and there's a need for both. But to the, the HANA point, as the, the two of those begin to come together, I think those roles are going to start coming closer, and I think HANA is kind of the glue that's going to bring them together because there's just not going to be a common platform between those two technologies until they both converge and they're both on HANA. So does HANA let us throw all of our ETL guys out the door? Depends. I thought that was another show we were leaving in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but, I mean, they're part of the team, maybe. Wait, wait, I need to go feed my unicorn. Hang on. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, in theory, some of the nitty-gritty of those tasks, the, the tougher sort of logistical data tasks, they go kind of go away in some sense, or they get transformed. But I, I don't know about you guys, but my perception of SAP customers is that the the HANA piece is sinking into the point that just about every customer you run into is thinking about what HANA means and trying to grapple with it, but it doesn't mean that they're charging full speed ahead with projects, and so 
I'm not seeing a real sort of herd towards HANA certification, but I do think that there is an increasing amount of awareness that that this this is part of the future of where we're headed, and and that in, doesn't just include HANA, right? It's it's kind of what HANA represents in terms of moving into an era where the whole nature of the kind of data you crunch and consume and make sense of is changing. And I'm not going to roll out the phrase "big data" in this podcast, I promise. But 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 of course, I just did. And things like Hadoop, you know, these are the things that companies are starting to look at and. Um, it does mean changing roles, and I agree with Greg, too, because some of these basis people haven't really been a part of that in the past. They've been more sort of orchestrators of overall system administration, and I think that's going to have to change. They're going to have to become data specialists, I think. And it's not so much big data, too. I, I right. totally agree with your point. It's it's the velocity of how we must take data, and again, I'm going to I'm going to pound this term, take data and turn it into information, right? We used right. to have months to do that, and then, you know, recently it's been day, weeks or days, and now it has to be done in seconds. It, it just has to yeah. be, or even in real time, or companies are just not going to be able to compete. So whatever you need to do in the background to, to deal with that velocity change in the way that we change data into information, you know, whatever. If that's HANA, maybe it, it, there's lots of ways to do it, but so it, that, that, it's a fundamental change. Would that be your basis people, though? I mean, that, no, that doesn't I don't seem think like so. the right fit for me. I mean, it doesn't seem like SAP systems are getting any easier to do all the stuff that basis people have traditionally done. I don't know that, you know, throwing a bunch of extra new stuff on their plate is the right solution. I, I don't think it is. I, I don't think it's a traditional basis person. Some sort of ninja no. cowboy. Yeah, n ninja cowboy is on the right track. Uh, the basis people that I talk with feel either threatened or excited by these changes, depending yeah. on who you talk to. But they will tell you that changes are coming. I mean, that's the reaction you get across the board. Um, so yeah, it's not. It it's gonna just dis disrupt them to use that horrible buzzword. Brief brief tangent as we talk about those basis people and the people flocking to learn HANA. What is your take on the response to the, the MOOCs that SAP is offering right now? Like the business objects MOOC. Last I looked, the enrollment had topped like 10,000 people. Um, you know, I, I noticed I'm even enrolled in the, the replay of Tom Young's, and there's like 23,000 people enrolled. I, I think it's it's clearly the future. You know, I think that um, you know the the technology is evolving a lot faster than people's ability to pay for their people to go to training on everything. So I, I think that you know there will still always be that you know five day in class training in Minneapolis to go to for for some things. But I think honestly, it's it's mostly you know people's jobs are going to be changing under their feet and. They'll just have to subscribe to stuff like this in order to keep up. I think it's a brilliant st strategic move on SAP's part to, to start giving that education away in that way that they have been. I mean, that, that MOOC movement is it, it's, it's gaining traction in the university level, but in the enterprise level, this is, it's, it, they're forerunners with this, uh, and I'm, I'm very impressed by it. Yeah, and, and I think you see them, I mean, you know, even with their announcement with the, and I always butcher it, but the Fiora, uh, how they're trying to embrace as much as possible the consumerization of the enterprise IT. Uh, I mean, I, I think this is, they understand that they've got a complex set of products and they're trying to lower the barrier of entry as much as possible. So one of the things that Jamie said a moment ago about, you know, is ETL dead? Is, is that writing on the wall? Um, you know, when you when you think about the the power of Hana, um, you know, Thorsten has has talked about this too. Where the convergence of OLTP and OLAP, you have um, the elimination of need to rebuild a warehouse off off your detailed data. You know, is is this the point in time when an enterprise starts to look at Hana for a a, a warehouse replacement? That I as an ETL guy need to start be thinking. Start rethinking. Sorry, uh, about what I'm going to do next. I I think that that is a ways off, right? I think that the promise is there, 
and I think that as new applications are built with HANA from the ground up, I think that that opportunity is there. But you know, you can run your business suite on HANA, but you still need all of the logic that happens in BW to make all of that stuff work, right? So you can't you can't just you know rip out your BW today and and suddenly you don't need to copy anything anywhere or anything. Again, even if you're running your business suite on HANA, right? You can optimize certain perf- certain things in there, but to just blanket say, you know, we're not going to need we're not going to need to do most of the stuff we've always been doing. I don't think it's there yet. Uh, I'm going to agree and disagree. So I, I think it's I, I do agree. I think it's a ways off, and I think that we do need that the logic that we have and that we're used to today. But I think. Again, you know, kind of what I alluded to earlier, the velocity at which we need to consume data, that is going to break down the traditional data warehouse model very, very quickly. I think more quickly than any of us want to admit. But, you know, the the, the COD's law, the third normal form, you know, the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key, so help me COD, that's going to break down very quickly. We don't need to do things that way anymore. The, the unstructured data and the way that we can jam stuff into HANA and Hadoop and all these other, I, I won't say it, uh, big data, um, <laughs> way that we can crunch and get information out of that data so much more quickly without having to go through all that rigmarole of data modeling and ETL and all that stuff that we used to do that takes months you or years to, to do. You still have to do all of that to get it out. You don't. You don't need to do that anymore. It doesn't you, matter how it happens in the background now. If you, I can get that data to you and it's still correct and it tur- I turn it into information within a matter of seconds, do you really care how I did it in the background? But how many people do you need trans- developing that data into information to satisfy the ad hoc query needs of an organization, right? Le- I mean, less I than you need lake. to build an enterprise data warehouse. Much, much less. I don't know that that's fair. I think I think it's a lot harder to get data out of Hadoop than people give it credit for. Yeah, and the, the, one, the one key word that you may have glossed over there is correct, the correct yeah. data. I mean, the biggest challenge with putting dropping visualization tools over HANA is people getting incorrect answers with it. Um, that's why, you know, you almost see that more as a sandbox I, I not prototype type environment. Huh? I, I will not disagree with that. that that's something yeah. we've been talking about. About too with all this network of truth talk and and something that I've been kind of on my soapbox about is as we bring in all of these different disparate data sources which is going to happen and I'm glad that we're doing it but you need to have some sort of reliability standard for the data that you're looking at because we're so used to the single version of the truth it's blessed it's clean and this is the way it's going to be but if we're going to bring in these other data sources I need to know how reliable they are give me a score, some sort of indicator as to this is, you know, this black and white or it's gray, and how gray is it if it's gray, right? So, but I think that there's still value in that gray data, and as that stuff becomes faster and faster, I just, I I just, that's going to be more the norm. Well, there's also some startups that are cropping up. I did a piece on one last last week, uh, and, and bigger information management vendors like Informatica are trying to go after this too, basically helping business users sort of normalize their own data based on semantic relationships and perceiving patterns in data and basically saving huge amounts of time. Like They just don't want to wait for the IT team to massage data and normalize it for three months. So I think there's going to be a lot of changes to let business users do more of that on the fly going forward. Uh, But it is more of a process. It's not going to happen overnight, but I really don't think that massaging data into one standard format is going to be the way of the future. The first thing to go is the aggregates because a lot of the aggregates were made just for performance reasons and when you have in-memory databases those performance <coughs> justifications aren't necessary so I think that's the first thing to go but you know, I, I think this debate will get settled more over time. I agree with what John just said. <laughs> um, you know, and, and a lot of technical ease just thrown back there. You know, I think there's there's a reality that um, yes, it, it is going to evolve over time, and as as people figure out how to exploit in memory technologies, yeah, you do still have to model it. I'm sorry, um, both how it's going to live at the database layer and how you're going to present it, because presentation is everything. 
right? And you want it to be presented correctly and govern it and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but I, I guess I'm curious, John, do you know of any, or Wes, any big customers that have already taken on this challenge that have trashed um, a traditional warehouse and said, you know what, we don't need that anymore. We've got HANA. Well, we see we see people using it as a, you know, the, the, this, not even necessarily the true form of the HANA sidecar, but using it as a prototype environment, and then you productionalize it off to the side in your traditional structured data warehouse. And so take it to be HANA, Hadoop, whatever, uh, in your sandbox prototype world. Uh, it's a place to do that discovery. It's a place that you can allow the business into. And, and frankly, you stamp all over the place, this is not production. <laughs> do not report this to anyone. Do not share this report. But use this to help you discover what are some of the next questions you want us to ask so that you can have focused development to productionalize that. I, see, I, I have seen it in that way. Wes froze on my screen for a sec. You look kind of scary. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, think, I don't know if it's my connection or y'all's or what, but we'll, we'll get it fixed. It's all good. The Sweet. audio was fine. <laughs> I, I can add just one more comment. The, the HANA customers I've spoken with around BW have mostly been using it to address issues in BW that they hadn't before or improve performance in BW. The, the big change that I've noticed is that more and more customers are using BW on HANA as a system of record now. Uh, which is just an increasing confidence in HANA as a platform and database versus at first they were always running it in parallel because they didn't want to risk having it be their main analytic system in case it went down or whatever. And I th a lot of that is in the past now, but I would agree with Wes because um, so far it isn't really replacing data warehouses. I've seen as much as spe it's more like specific data use cases that have yet to be expanded enterprise-wide. That's what I've seen so far anyway. Right. That's. I don't think any companies are, you know, reporting their government numbers strictly off of that without other, uh, you know, intermediary steps. Righto. I'm not sure we've really figured out what a team looks like. Is it just me? <laughs> well, uh, We're gonna let, another let, hour. Let me throw out there. I think there's one part of of what I would think is any part of a, a modern um, team that we haven't really talked about, and that's the data scientist. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, nerd. <laughs> I, I just think that there's there's that that role is is critical now, and I think it was only, you know, that the role's not new. It's been around for a long time in the pharmaceutical and in the financial industries, but I think that as... Um, these analytic tools are getting smarter and becoming more widespread that people need to have that that competency as a part of their BI team. The data scientist, someone who knows statistics, who knows how to uh, to crunch data and do predictive, I think because predictive is really be going, going to be the future of BI. It's, it's certainly one thing to say what have we done and how have we been doing, but the, the differentiator and where I, I think a lot of this is going in the future is how are we going to do? What are we going to be doing tomorrow or next week or next year? Um, that, that predictive piece is going to be crucial and you need to have a smart data scientist or scientists on your staff to be able to make that work because that can very easily um, be, be messed up. <laughs> you have to have someone who knows what they're doing or it's going to get muddy really quick. Now with that, I, so I, I'm not typically a huge fan of outsourcing the, um, the business analysis part of your business intelligence piece, right? So if it's really getting in and understanding how your supply chain works um, or how your HR system works or whatever it is. Like I, I think that a lot of times, you know, you're better off building those skill sets from within the business to define those requirements, you know, understand those processes and all that stuff. I think data scientists actually represent a really easy thing to outsource um, because it seems like those guys and girls just step in and look at the data in a perfect world completely unbiased, right? No preconceived notions of what, you know, they would expect to happen. They just kind of crunch through everything and then what comes out comes out. Um, do you... I mean, am I am I on the nose with that, or am I am I way off? 
I, I think that no, I, I think you're mostly right. So I think in in many many cases, it's really just having a, a solid understanding of uh, of data science, of statistics, of you know regression, whatever types of things you're you're going to be running, and the numbers are the numbers. It's you know a mathematician can do math; doesn't matter what industry they're doing it for. I think there are times when having some industry expertise as well helps. Um, you know, having some financial services background myself, I know that some of the folks that that did that type of stuff in, in financial companies, it, it helped to understand the business of what it was they were doing. So I'm not sure that that's something as easily outsourced. There, there are cases where the industry knowledge is really critical to the analysis being done. Yeah, and you're never going to get away from having to have an understanding of the business you're trying to provide the analytics for. Uh, I mean, especially as we start moving to these quicker, more iterative releases, uh, I mean, you, you almost are getting to the point where you have to have a report writer that understands the business, that can sit next to somebody that understands the business and create that information for you. So some, some organizations are being forced to outsource those roles in some ways. Yeah, I'm of a couple different minds on this, but I think that the fact that SAP has what like 80 data scientists they're making available to customers it's either 60 or 80 I for, maybe one of you guys can remember but the, I actually met a data scientist at TechEd too so I now know what one looks like um, <laughs> were they really nerdy looking up? <laughs> you know he was a little bit like nerdy kind of cute he had a yeah, he white had, lab coat right he had a twist of Justin Bieber he oh. was yeah he was a little bit of a player he sounds adorable. I think data scientists get around more than I realize, but Just hug him all day. <laughs> but 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 I, I think this. So, so if you're gonna if you're gonna make sixty or eighty available to your customers, it does indicate what Jamie's pointing out that someone can come in from the outside and make an impact. But I do think this goes back to teams a little bit because companies have different philosophies. But I would prefer that those skills be cultivated in house at some point. I think they're that important, so I wouldn't be very comfortable with just relying on the outside world for stuff like that. But I've never been a fan of ivory tower BI. I kind of feel like the more you can get these tools and these and these capabilities in the hands of day-to-day -day users, instead of saying, "Oh, you have to jump through all these sophisticated hoops in order to do anything," I just don't. That's just not an approach I happen to like. So, do you mean um, it, by cultivating that knowledge, it's it's not only leveraging their expertise to build effective models, but as they learn the business more, build smarter models. Yeah, exactly. So that who knows your business better than your your sort of, I guess, your sort of super user analyst, right? Um, and they might not have a deep training in predictive, but why why wouldn't you want to sit a data scientist down with that team and help help them get smarter and better at that stuff? Or let them uh, go to one of Hasso Plotner Institute courses or whatever it is, you know, like like... I'd want to upskill those people more than just rely on, like that Justin Bieber guy that I met. <laughs> uh, I don't really well, know. so isn't that sort of true of your whole BI team, though? I mean, don't you really want all of those people grown internally, or or am I missing the point? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think organizations do. They just can't. I, I mean, it, it just there's such a shortage of. I saw a shocking stat a few few weeks ago where there's going to be something like in three years a shortage of 200,000 um, folks in the BI space. Money. But what's even more shocking is is, is like one and a half million managers that know it. So that's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you hear that, kids in school? Don't go to BI. <laughs> I. I hope you're enjoying this discussion on BI rate mercenaries. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to come in and destroy your teams with their high-priced contract demands. <laughs> and they just graduated last week. Um, <laughs> but they're certified, so that's good. <laughs> oh, so, you know, the other, the other thing about predictive that I don't necessarily get yet is that um, I'm used to the role of having a data scientist that does all the really hard nerdy stuff for us, but now you've got predictive from from on the BI side as a tool, as a desktop that's you know empowering analysts everywhere. And and will will that line continue to blur too on where the data scientist fits? Um, 
Like, well, can tools get smart enough to help you pick the right model based on your data set? Sure. And then can they? And then can they be smart enough to tell you how to make decisions based on that data? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just blue sky here, right? I don't know. If there's ever going to be a good substitute for a human being understanding statistics and the the, the models that you're applying. I, I, I mean, that obviously the systems are going to evolve and get really good at that, but. Uh, that where that becomes really really easy, that's just a long way off. It, I think it really put is. That in the idea place, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> You're replacing Skynet. Yeah, you know. Sure. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that sort of stood in the way of that for a long time has been the technology, right? I mean, now that we can do that, we can run a model on something that used to take a day and a half, and now comes back in four minutes. I mean, I think it does give you the possibility to say, well, I want to run it through every model and see what – and and I'll evaluate all of those results and see which one is the most interesting. I don't know that that's that far off. I think John was going to add something there. Well, I was just getting excited because I thought Skynet was going to destroy us. Now I found it's going to make us money. <laughs> Instead, it's pretty cool. Stay in school, kids. No, I, so uh, – with, without getting overly technical here, but so the the fundamental um, the tenet with statistics is the larger your sample, the more accurate your predictions are going to be, right? So HANA definitely plays a, a part in that by uh, allowing us to have these massively large samples to, to run these analyses on. But I still think it, at this point it, it's only as good as the data that goes into it. And I'm not sure the system really knows. I mean, it does, I guess, to a degree. But you really have to have a, a human to interpret what is that, or what is that determination that that um, you know, uh, what, what's your R squared? Do, do, do you know? I mean, it's going to spit it out and say that that how how confident am I that this is right? But uh, uh, you still need a human. All right, so let me get this straight. Um, we definitely need data scientists still. Um, we we definitely need, still need our admins unless you're going to go to the cloud. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, we, our business analysts, whether they live in the business or in IT, are still important people to us, right? We need some code monkeys writing some reports in some universes maybe. Interesting. Uh, I, there's an maybe, interesting maybe idea. Not. There's an interesting identity crisis coming there, right? We we just talked about that and and the future of SAP uh, BI thing from Ty coming up here soon is going to be helpful. You know what's what does that semantic layer look like? Is the universe the future? Um, is there a place for this semantic layer developer? Whether you're modeling on Hana or you're modeling in a universe, whatever the case might be. Um, and you could be a DBA and rock it like a. I don't know. But you've got to be a good DBA. Most DBAs are not good DBAs. Wait, I thought DBAs were didn't have to be good in HANA because HANA makes you a good DBA. Well, it depends on how you define DBA. I just DBA. made that up. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody who knows how to write a really slick query, I think that that skill set is only going to get more important with HANA because you're not going to be you know, using tools to, to transform data over time, right? You're just going to have to figure out how to convert it from the source into what you want it to look like on the other end. You Fast know, garbage, you... right? <laughs> Wait, Greg, say something. I couldn't read your subtitle. What is it now? Fast garbage. Understand what... Uh, what R squared is. is. Sorry. Got a little nerdy on you. Stop it. Hi, Becca. Jamie's Jamie's muted. Jamie's having a conversation without us. Yeah, uh, real wife is making snarky comments about DBAs in the other room as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> real wife's neck dog. Takes a special kind of person to be a DBA. That's all I'll say about it. Careful. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Don't get fired, Greg. So is there right. is there anybody else we're missing in this love quadrangle that we call BI? Who's the, who's the overall leadership? Do you have technical leadership as well as project leadership or just one? We don't need leadership. We have Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> We're going agile, right? We just ask our questions to the rest of the world and then make a decision. Yeah. We still need somebody with a budget. 
I was just going to say, the people that pay for it, right? So, I mean, they're an essential part of the team. They need to still see the value and and have the decision-making authority to commit that budget to it year after year. Well, and really, do we need, I mean, do we need more training people, right? If we've got more people using tools in the future, do we need to worry more about that? Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities. We need more developers in BI than we've had like application developers than we used to if we're going against things like Hadoop and, you know, using Design Studio and stuff, right? That's not tool user type stuff. Did, did you just call me a tool? Yes. <laughs> Are you denying it? No. Okay. Yeah, really, you do need a programmer apparently to work with uh, Design Studio. It's, it's it's hard to be gentle there, but you know, I I saw that tweeted screenshot of lines and lines of code, and I'm like, what? Yeah. I don't want that. I, I just installed it for a customer, and I I launched it to test it, and I'm like, what the hell am I looking at? <laughs> you know? So I want to push buttons that make pretty things, not yeah. write pretty things. Right. I want, to see, I, I want to hear the Jamie blog after he tries to use Design Studio. I'm sorry. John, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I didn't have anything super interesting to add anyway. I was just pointing out you still need a straw man to walk the plank when the project goes south. That never changes. So. That's, that's what consultants are for. That's, that, that's yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me. nice. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we, we, we didn't talk about this part, and I, I don't know that there are this is any one role, but there, there's definitely that consumerization factor around user experience and that it's just not simple enough to give someone a canned report or an open query. They kind of need the experience in BI that is right for their role, and so I don't even know what that's called, but it seems like everyone needs to understand that better, right? Yeah, so SAP actually has a, a concept out now that they've, they've started socializing a little bit around BI personas. Um, which is something I think that has been very under considered in the past. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more uh, about that stuff coming out. But yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. We, we do need to consider the different uh, consumers of BI and, and what they actually need versus what we want to provide. Because we found that you know one tool, even something as amazing as Desky or whatever, um, can't really meet the needs of everybody all at once. Yeah. Which is why we have a suite. We have a whole suite of tools. Yeah, and and PowerPoint presentations dedicated to telling you how to pick the right tool for the right need. <laughs> Here, user, go read Wait, this and then build your vision. Never mind. Do they animate the changes in names every quarter? Does that does that work? <laughs> you can pick your friends and you can pick your BI tools. But... <laughs> Didn't we do that for OS's once, like in the very beginning? Yeah, I think we, we did. did. I think we you can did. pick your OS. You can pick friends, you can pick your OS, but you can't pick your friends OS. That's when we were really new. That was like episode two. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's more consumer friendly than a million choices, right? <laughs> It's all documented. Go read it. <laughs> Not <laughs> correct. We didn't say it was documented in English. Right. We just went too far. This is kind <laughs> Um, John, bring us back. Oh, uh, I just, I just think if you give users an interface like MySpace with the black screens and. <laughs> Can we make it play music when they hit a new page? That's what I was that thinking. Yeah, amazing. exactly. My report is going to have unicorns, whether you like it or not. And dubstep. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when your boss when your boss reviews your 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 predictive assessment, I think Black Sabbath War Pig should be cranking in the background. <laughs> And you're only going to get that with a real emphasis on user experience. So right. let's get right. that part right. If and, not and Black Sabbath, then REO Speedwagon, right? Yeah, and, and don't forget about the mobile cloud piece too, right? You want to be able to stream more pigs on your mobile device than <laughs> the cloud. <laughs> but I, I, do think, I do think that 
that how users consume information that personas piece extends to mobile as well because I just I've seen some really cool BI stuff on mobile devices and I've seen some flat out terrible stuff that I would never use. I don't know if you can just force people to use it. I'm kind of out of touch with how companies work with stuff like that. Jamie, Jamie, maybe you have insight. He doesn't know either. Are you kidding? <laughs> no. no, I think you're right. I, I think it, um, I think you can be surprised how how difficult it is to sell something as uh, intuitive and uh, you know that seems like a no brainer like mobile BI to uh, to an organization. But I think uh, I think we gotta give it a shot. You know, I think you guys have just touched on something that we haven't really emphasized and that and Greg has presented on this really, really well and, and that's an evangelist or champion in your own organization. Like every BI shop, whether it comes from IT or comes from the business, just needs the the, the person that's gonna tell the best story of why you need BI. Or it's just gonna be dull yeah. and just reporting. Uh, well, I think it actually has to be from the business and from IT, right? And preferably from multiple people in the business, almost like an account rep and you know a technical sales guy, to uh, to get a lot of that stuff really cooking in your organization. So we're actually recording this on election day, but um, <laughs> part of that presentation that Eric was just talking about, I talk about this being like um, a candidate for public office, where you have to build this grassroots. Uh, sort of uh, movement for these these different types of projects. So it, it, right, it's not just IT. It's the business folks. It's the the operations folks. It's it's everyone that might have a stakeholder in it. You have to really kind of go and sneaker wear and you know and press the flesh. And I'm going to use as many buzzwords as I can here uh, for political different things. But seriously, so if you're the the champion or the true believer in in this type of, of effort, which it, you know there should be one in every every company, but it, you have to be the one that that goes and builds that consensus to get that unified voice of constituents to talk to the people that have the budget and say, "This is what we need to do, and this is why we need to do it, and this is how much money it's going to make you save you whatever." Right? It has to be that unified voice. It can't just be one person. I, I've been that one person, and it's a very lonely place to be. One is the no. No. well. We've um we've talked about a couple of personas. Anybody got any others they want to throw out before we start to bring this to a close? I'm sure we didn't hit them all. It's too big now. We could spend two hours talking about this probably. Yeah. Did we get the important think, ones? I I still think you you need some kind of technical leadership, an architect to sort through all of the different potential options you have from a technology perspective and, and I don't know if we've if that was just implied in everything we've talked about to date or if it, we need to call it out specifically I think we do need to call it out specifically I think uh, I think the need for a, a translator to go from that person to the uh, the business leadership as well is really important mm -hmm. somebody who can say you know yes I <laughs> You asked if you could have a dashboard, and they gave you an 18-page response that talked about what tools we had and whatever. And you know, at the end, the answer is yes, and it will take this long and cost this much. So you want to take a you, you want a people person, somebody that takes the requirements from the customers to the engineers. That, that yes. Hurt. Yeah. I mean, not physically take them from the customers <laughs> to the engineers, right? Their secretary would do that. But that, that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People that's really your realist, though, right? That's that. I'm that's the person person. that understands how it all works, <laughs> and they're they're the ones that are able to really deliver yeah, a meaningful estimate. You know, when when you have business people say, "Well, I want this, this, and that, and I want it tomorrow." Well, you need to have that that technical wizard, that architect, whatever, that sits there and says, "Well, yeah, okay, either yes, I can do that, or no, you're smoking crack." Um, you know, you, you have to have that person that that, that can bridge the both, that the business side plus the technical and know how the whole picture works. Totally it's agree. Like, it's like my wife. She's as far from IT as could possibly be, but she always says, don't be stupid, set realistic expectations. <laughs> you need that person on your side. <laughs> uh, those are rare. Those are really rare. I like the idea of the BI escort. Hello, I'm here to walk you to your mandatory meeting. <laughs> if you're such a dope, you're going to blow it off if I'm not here. 
<laughs> that could be a provision role. I, I'm glad you went there. You said escort, <laughs> and I got concerned. I, I did too. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I've, I was just back from Vegas, so you know how it goes. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the, one, way through. the one thing I did want to say, though, uh, I think you guys have done a really good job of charting out the main roles, and the only thing I would add is that what I, I just did a presentation on this topic in Vegas, but what I was sort of my mission is to get people to think about each team member as not just a hands-on person, but as as an advisor. Because you talk about the MOOCs and the open learning, there's no excuse not to know other tools besides the ones your company's using. There's no excuse to know like more than just what SAP is doing. There's no excuse not to understand and dig into SAP's roadmap via conversations online because if you're just a heads down person and you can't say well here's some of the other ways you could go about this or here's an open source solution we may want to consider if you don't have that intellectual curiosity and passion for your field I don't see how you advance much further I just think it's becoming essential to people think of it as like a dirty word because it's like well I'm not a consultant I'm an employee but I, I would argue we're all consultants now we need to take on that job in our own specialty we need like a tagline don't be a dinosaur in the making <laughs> You just said it really well, John. Uh, is that you, John? Is that said that in the past? If you're not, uh, if you're not getting ahead, then you're falling behind. <laughs> it is one of the ways I try to ram that point home. <laughs> but I try to adopt a new slogan now. You know, it's the new <laughs> political season. So <laughs> now, now Mark it's probably said something that applies. Now, we'll go now for the for the apps economy, it's now create or die with with a nod to gaping void. Uh. <laughs> All right. Was that War Pigs? <laughs> All right. I can queue it up if you want. <laughs> yeah, we all need entrance music. That would be awesome. Outro. All right. Well, I think we've 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 run to the top of the hour, and it's probably a good time to pull the plug on this episode. Um, I'm sure there's other people we haven't mentioned and we didn't ignore you on purpose. You're just not that important. I'm totally kidding. Hey, feel free to leave a comment. Talk about it. Keep the discussion going or join us on Twitter. Um, hey, we got a new thing going too. Don't don't miss out on a chance to ask DSLayer. Hashtag ask DSLayer. Uh, we want to talk about nerdy stuff with you too. And uh, maybe John will come back and Wes will come back and laugh at you too later. Um, to bring us to a close, John, Wes, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Pleasure. Um, always, yeah, good times. always fun. And Wes, I hope I catch you again before you fly again next time. Jamie, Greg, cheers, guys. Ciao. Good night. Good night. This podcast is hosted and sponsored by EV Technologies. Visit us on the net at 